this is uh, with, with reference to the earlier part of your talk this evening. You mentioned, Longpo, you mentioned three knowledge, uh, knowledges. May I know what they are? And may you explain the details? Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is the Tewi Cha. Uh, when we talk about the qualities of the Buddha, we say uh, Wicha Charana Sampano. The Wicha is the Tewi Cha, the three knowledges that the Buddha is complete with. So they say on the night of his enlightenment, um, the first part of the night, um, he was able to recollect his past lives. Um, you know, endless past lives, going back thousands, millions of past lives, as long as he focused his mind back, because it was so mindful, concentrated, pure, quiet, still, he was able to recollect uh, innumerable past lives. Um, I think the technical term is Pupeni Wasanu Satyana. And then the Second knowledge, you know, later on in the light, in in the night, in the middle part of the night, is the knowledge of the arising and passing away of beings according to their karma. So, when somebody dies, it's that knowledge knowing where they are reborn, where their stream of consciousness rearises uh, according to the karma. So, in what realm they become a ghost or deva, or back as a human or an animal, whatever. And again, you know, the Buddha's mind is so clear that there's no limit to that kind of knowledge. He can know whoever he directs his mind to know, he can know their karma and where they arise after death. And then in the last watch of the night, the last part, just before dawn, as I was saying, you know, the final of the, these three knowledges is the knowledge of the end of the asavas, asavakaya jnana. That's the that's nibbana, the end of the mental defilements. All greed is abandoned, all anger is abandoned, all delusion is abandoned, gone. So the mind is completely free, pure, clear, without suffering. It's, we call it the unconditioned or the deathless. Um, and as a human being, having done that, he's showing us that we can do it too. But that's easy. I hope that answers the question. Um, the second question is on Cheryl. So, uh, Lampo, if uh, one has a desire to be free from suffering, how can one use this desire skillfully? And is having this desire bad? Um, yeah, well, we talk about uh, skillful desire or, or unskillful desire in Buddhism or uh, chanda, kusala chanda. Chanda means desire. Um, or gama chanda is sensual desire, which is an unskillful desire. And then, of course, danha is unskillful desire, craving desire, wanting. And so in, when we come to practice, the unskillful desire can always slip into our thinking, into our attitude if we're not aware, and we can start to crave the results of the practice. So we crave uh, the happiness of offering dana, the happiness of keeping precepts, the happiness of samadhi, uh, the happiness of enlightenment. We just focus on the end result we can become obsessed with that. I want it. I want to be peaceful. I want to be happy. I want to be free from suffering. But with that obsessive desire coming from ignorance, and that actually is a cause of suffering, because as long as you haven't got it, got the uh, the object of your desire, you, you're discontent. But then wholesome or skillful desire is focusing more on you know the causes that will lead you to the end of suffering, that will lead you to progress in the path. So 
wholesome desire is leading you to put effort into bringing up mindfulness or to investigate the Dhamma or train your mind to let go of greed, anger and delusion. It leads on to skillful action, wholesome action. Whereas unwholesome desire leads on to just more wanting, craving, more discontent, more dissatisfaction. So one way of recognizing the difference between kinds of desires is looking at the results, what they do to your mind. So unwholesome desire stirs you up, you're not peaceful. And, you know, if we're observant, we'll notice even in meditation, sometimes we're trying too hard, just wanting success, wanting results, wanting knowledge, wanting peace. When you recognize that's what's going on, and then you release your mind a bit from that kind of desire, then you often you get very quick, quickly start to feel better, feel more at ease. And you notice when you're not caught into unwholesome desire, when you just have the uh, wholesome desire to bring up mindfulness on an object, say, then you're much more content in the present moment just to do the job of putting attention on the breath, for example. And if you're not yet particularly peaceful, it doesn't matter. You just go back to putting your attention on the breath. In the same way, if you're doing a job of work, you, know, you say you're um, washing the dishes, <laughs> for example. If you just focus on washing the dishes, the dish you've got in your hand, getting that dish clean and then moving on from one dish to another, you know, the whole job can seem quite peaceful and you might be fairly content just doing it. But if you're thinking, when am I going to finish the whole, all of these dishes, there's so many dishes, I want to be free from this job so I can do something else, then you'll be discontent, you'll complain, you'll be irritated with the job and time will go slowly. So part of our skill or knowledge in meditation is getting to recognize when we're being affected by unskillful desire mixed up with craving, wanting, and then recognizing how to cultivate the skillful desire. You know, seeing the difference between the two and then acting accordingly, abandoning unskillful desire which leads to restlessness, suffering, and cultivating the skillful desire which brings a sense of contentment, peace, energy, good energy with it. Are there any more questions on the floor? You can click on the reset button. Yes, Richard. Good evening, and thank you for this evening's talk. Um, in um, in many of your talks, you you cover Sakya Sakaya Ditti, um, and the the sort of losing that impression of self that we have, you know, conditioned, you know, from an early age. Um, I've heard it said that, you know, ego is best, you know, uh, a bit like a. a, a a car tire, you don't want it to overinflate it, you don't want it underinflated. It's best there's a happy medium. Thinking about the Buddha, I often wonder, you know, how his what sort of personality or how um, he projected uh, his, his um, character, um, even though we don't have videos or anything like that. Um, in life, out, out in the world, it might be different in the monastery, but, you know, often we are sort of, we need to express a personality to be, you know, to have that some degree of ego in dealings, you know, whether it's work or going shopping even. Um, how do we, what is the right level? How do we walk and how do we walk that, that um, tightrope? Thank you. Yeah, so a really good point. Um, 
The Buddha himself was a bit separate or different because we, from the text we have the description of the qualities of the Buddha, like what we call the 32 marks, physical characteristics of the Buddha, and then um, certain qualities, you know, the way he speaks, the Buddha never lies, never <clears throat> says anything that doesn't make sense, uh, doesn't make mistakes with his speech, uh, he's always mindful and so on. So the Buddha is exceptional in the way he presents himself to the world. Everyone else, even Arahants, they have still have certain character traits that they never abandon. But the reason we talk a lot about Sakaya Ditti is because we're developing an understanding that whatever character traits you have, your personality, physical, mental attributes, they're impermanent. And they're suffering in the sense they they can't bring us lasting happiness and they're not self, they're conditioned things. That's, that's the insight you're developing to remove Sakaya Ditti. So it doesn't mean to say you have to give up your sense of humor or your particular you know, knowledge and memories and it doesn't mean to say you have to start acting like a robot or in some strange unnatural way in the world. Like you say, you have an ego. It's understanding that this ego is not self, it's impermanent. Of course, we still do train ourselves to some certain level. So we have the practice of precepts, five precepts, which is very central to uh, the Buddhist teaching, and if you want to abandon Sakaya Ditti, you also have to you know, be using the five precepts to do that, to train yourself. So you keep the five precepts, so you undertake not to kill, not to take what is not given, not to commit acts of sexual misconduct, harmful sex, not to lie or uh, abuse verbally other people, and not to take intoxicants. But within that, you know, you can keep the five precepts and you can still talk, <laughs> you can still have a sense of humor, or you can be very introverted, very quiet, you can have all kinds of knowledge and skills depending on your particular character. You can express yourself in public when you're shopping, when you're working, you can give instructions, you can receive instructions but you stay within the bounds of the five precepts. That's the important thing. So you're not doing or saying things that hurt, harm other people or yourself. And then on a more refined level, where you're working particularly on with your attachment to views and the conceit of self in its worst, you might say its worst excesses. So right up until you're enlightened, there's going to be a little bit of trace of self there. So, you know, we can't just abandon it just like that. But you work on the worst excesses. So, you know, what in the world you might call the big ego or the, um, the, the arrogant ego or the somebody who's really uh, conceited in one way or the other. And remember, conceit can also be inferiority conceit. So. Sometimes it comes out, you know, we feel really inferior in a situation or just in the way we look at the world. And that can harbor you know, depression or resentments. Or we can have superiority conceit. We walk around thinking we're much better than everyone and looking down on people. So in conjunction with practicing the five precepts, we're also investigating our attachment to views and then conceit. and. You might say, restraining the worst excesses of those. Um, but yet, you don't, you know, we can't expect quick results or, or immediate results in that respect. Yeah, so not a work in progress, working with conceit, self-view. Um, so the starting point is just learn to cooperate with other people cultivate sort of harmonious, harmless relations with others. Whatever other people do, that's their business. And some of them may be trying to harm us, unfortunately, but we're working on ourselves. <clears throat> but within that, there's plenty of room for personality. If you look, you know, in the time of the Buddha, you've got what we call the 80 Asiti Sawakas, leading uh, Arahant enlightened disciples of the Buddha. 
and they were all different in the sense they all had their different particular skills, knowledges, attributes, personality traits, and um, some were very quiet, some were very talkative, some had skills, you know, they could explain the Dhamma very well, they could give long talks, some people, would, some of them would give very short statements that really explain the Dhamma. Um, some of them had psychic powers, some of them were very generous, some of them were very compassionate and knew how to put that into operation in their daily life. So you realize even Arahants could be quite, can appear quite different, they have their different personalities and from my experience in Thailand, with meeting with and living with different teachers, some of them are considered to have been Arahants. You know, they still have their different characters, and so some are a bit gruff, and talk direct and scold the monks and it can be kind of come across as a bit rough and ready. Some can be very serene and just hardly say much at all. Some have a sense of humor, some deliberately seem to have sabotaged their sense of humor because they realized it was an attachment for them and they become very kind of not very humorous at all, but with mindfulness. Um, and you just see a whole array of different characters. But it's not that they don't talk anymore, they don't relate to the world, they do, but they keep the precepts and they don't harm people in what they say and what they do. And that's the important point, I think. Thank you. Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you, Nampo. The follow up question with regards to uh, meditation. So, this is from Upo. Um, could Longpo please explain what is Chitta Sankara and how does one observe that during meditation and how, how would we abandon Chitta Sankara? Well, we're training in mindfulness, developing mindfulness um, directed to the body, to know the body as a body, feelings as feelings, mind as mind, and then mind objects, dhammas as, as dhammas. So within that, the jitta is the mind. And how do we know the mind? Well, we know it mainly through the contents of the mind. So as we become mindful, we're becoming mindful of jitta sankara, mental formations, what the mind is creating, throwing up, uh, good and bad. So, you know, wholesome mental formations, mental states rooted in wholesome qualities like uh, non-greed, non-anger, non-delusion, and then mental formation is rooted in unwholesome qualities, greed, anger, and delusion. And they may not come up saying, I am greed, I am anger, or I am non-greed, non-anger. You, you have to look and learn and you know, identify them in different ways through the, the associated feeling of pleasure and pain, through the nature of the, the, the mind itself. It's peaceful or it's very agitated. Um, and you know, sometimes it's good to read the Buddha's words on what these mental states are, the wholesome ones, the unwholesome ones, and then what we call the mental factors, the jeta seekers that come up with them. So, you know, what's an example of a wholesome mental formation? Kindness, or compa goodwill, or compassion, or faith, or wisdom, or mindfulness, energy. What is an example of an unwholesome mental formation or maybe some form of um, greed, attachment, um, ill will, jealousy, envy, sloth and torpor and so on. So often you're seeing the Jitta Sankara as wholesome, as unwholesome, but as you establish mindfulness you're also learning some basic characteristics of these jitta sankharas is that they're impermanent. You know, they arise, they cease. And sometimes we miss that because they're arising and ceasing so fast or they're arising and ceasing continuously on a theme as it were. So it seems like you have just one continuous mood in the mind or one continuous jitta sankara, but actually it's not. It's very um, 
brief moments, but they're linked together. And as you become more aware, mindfulness improves. You're seeing that the the impermanent nature of jitta sankara, and then because it, they're impermanent, they have a beginning, they arise, they pass away. We say they're dukkha. They're unsatisfactory. They don't last. They're no. They're not reliable. You know, in one day, how many jitta sankaras arise and pass away? So they, you can't take them as sort of a reliable source of happiness for yourself. You can use them, and we use Jitta Sankara to understand, to, to practice this path and understand and develop wisdom and understanding, but in themselves, their nature, you know, their dukkha, and they're also not self, they're conditions that arise according to causes and conditions. Jitta Sankaras arise and then they pass away. And the more we establish mindfulness and reflect on our mind, the more you're becoming aware of that. So then there's some, you know, you're, you're developing this higher knowledge of the seeing the three characteristics in, in both body and mind, anicca, dukkha, anatta. And this is training the mind that gives rise to the sense of dispassion detachment, relinquishment, as I was saying earlier in the talk, giving away, giving up, letting go of attachment. Because when you see if you're attached as Jitsa Sankaras, as self, as permanent, as happiness, then you suffer. When you see them as they are, you, you tire of that attachment, that clinging, so you, you let go. You, you, you let go of that which is suffering. That may, I think for most of us, it's a gradual practice, maybe over many years. But, you know, if you keep doing it, you keep watching, looking, learning, you do become a little wiser and you don't cling on quite so tightly to the Jitta Sankaras. You just know them. You use them when you need, you know, we need to use thought, of course, in our practice, in our life. We need to use thought and mental states to gain knowledge, understanding, to do things. But also, you're also seeing the drawbacks of just blind attachment to them, because they lead us all over the place. And that's what suffering is, isn't it? Lots of stressful thoughts coming up. So get to know them with mindfulness. Self. That is long time. One final question. Um, this is from Ray Fang, and her question is that, um, from Paul, my loved ones have been instructed to donate assets to the temple after they pass on. Is there a difference in the merits making by a living being or a deceased person? Well, the intention, I assume you're talking about somebody's written a will or something like that, and the intention writing that will is a very powerful good intention obviously that was done by a living person um, and if you keep that intention right to the word to the to the end of your life then it's a very powerful conditioning force on the mind it's a very powerful good karma and of course once you're dead it doesn't matter anymore you're gone and you don't know what happens and, you know, you assume, you hope that the living will follow the instructions of the will and do what is supposed to be done. Um, but don't worry too much about it. You know, when you die, you don't want to die with a lot of worries and concerns. Are they going to follow the will? What are they going to do? Will they really carry it out? Because that holds you back. Maybe you become a hungry ghost floating around your family saying, did they do it? Did they do it? <laughs> Like uh, in Ajahn Mun's biography, there's the brother and sister who built a chedi, which is a great um, offering to the Buddha in, in you know, re reverence of the Buddha, to, a chedi to house relics. But they were so attached to it when they died, they became hungry ghosts floating around it, obsessed with it. You know, the good that we do is to help us let go. And then we have to let go of the very good that we do as well, you know, not just... Other things, we let go of the very data that we do, we let go of it. So, if you write a will with that instruction, good. 
could even think about doing something dana before you die just to be absolutely sure that you've let go but anyway if you've written the will once you die just let it all go don't worry about it it's not your problem anymore you can relax move on to your next life or to nibbana <laughs> Thank you, Mangpa. That's all the questions that we have for this evening, Mangpa.